Now, last year I featured Peter Jastermski and Brian Rickett reading from their book, Just Dust and Stone, a book of their split sequences. And Tia Haynes, editor of Prune Juice, said of this book that it's nothing short of a masterpiece, bold yet intimate. These visionary poems are pure magic, with intricate dynamics and seamless transitions. It is clear that Rickett and Jastermski are not only masters of their craft, but also a powerhouse team, a must read. And she was right. Now, the idea of split sequences proved so popular here at Poetry P that we instigated a special submission period last year. And you'll be pleased to know there are two more this year. Don't forget to check out our submission calendar for all that we read on the Poetry P website. And so I've invited Peter back to the podcast. And as a bonus, he can give you a kickstart for the next split sequence submissions. Details, along with details of Peter and Brian's book, are in the show notes as always. You had questions after Peter's last visit, and I know he had some from would-be practitioners. So we've put them together and I hope you enjoy what we come up with. So Peter, welcome back to Pete Towers and Poetry P. How have you been since your last visit? I've been doing fine. Writing some poetry, of course, Mm -hmm. and getting out in nature and um, looking forward to a good 2023. Excellent. Aren't we all? Let's hope it, um, it's a good year for us. So, Peter, I told one of our listeners that we were going to be talking tonight, Jerome Berglund, who I know always enjoys a split sequence, and he's had some success getting them published. And his response was, wow, that's so exciting, Patricia. Please thank him from the bottom of our community's hearts for introducing such a powerful approach and tool to utilise for collaboration. I think it's safe to say, Peter, he's a fan. Thank you, Jerome, and your community. (laughs) Keep writing. (laughs) So before we head off on our odyssey of questions, Peter, can I ask you to read one of your split sequences for us, just to get us in the mood? Okay, be glad to do that. This is a piece that was published in McQueen's Quinterly, 2021. And uh, I chose this one because People are curious as to what you can do with the form. And this piece uh, is a little different. Not everybody's cup of tea, but I'm going to read the um, seed haiku, which is really a haiku, pretty much. And then the three poems that go in between the three lines are definitely senro. So I thought this was an interesting mix. See what you think. It's called The Bargain. After Hours unwrapping the stars where they fall. That's the seed haiku. Okay, the bargain. After hours, Satan's holiday, mixing stripes with plaids. Unwrapping the stars, a sharpened stake, poking through a new thesaurus. Where they fall, die laughing. We will when we want to. Peter, I, I very much enjoyed that. I found it a very, or a deliciously naughty story interwoven with the original <laughs> scene poem. Thank you for getting us going. Now, I hope after that you're all fired up to hear what Peter has to tell us. So we'll begin. I'm going to put your questions to him and see where they take us. And our first port of call, Peter, are mm-hmm. titles. Why do you consider them necessary? That's a very good question. Um, Well, here's my logic on that. You know, since the split sequence creates a narrative and the narrative becomes a type of storyline, in my view, the story could use a title. And rather than limit someone's understanding of what the piece is, I think the title would allow the author to slant the piece towards a specific meaning. Some pieces are kind of ambiguous and the title would give a a certain aspect and meaning to the piece. Or you can use the title to slant away from an anticipated meaning. So the reader might say, oh, this is about this. The title suggests another reading, another level of ambiguity within the piece. As you can see from my uh, perspective, I like to have 
ambiguity in pieces, different readings and so forth. So I guess to sum it up, a title can create clarity or mystery as is needed. Okay, so it's kind of a creative use of something other people would find, you know, really limits things. But on that note, the editor that published my very first pieces wanted titles for the pieces because I didn't send any titles in. They came up with titles. And the next editor for journal number two, even though I included titles, would never publish them, even though I said, publish my titles, please. Never do it. So honestly, if you can't come up with a title um, or you're really resistant to the idea, that might be the one piece of the form that you know we probably could live without because it's going to mean something to somebody you just put untitled. But generally, people have had no problems coming up with titles. So um, I think it works within the format. There's not a lot of rules. That's just one of them. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about the rules uh, towards the end of our chat today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I want to go back to the bargain. And mm -hmm. you, you just said a title can create clarity or mystery as needed. So how do you see the title in, in your piece, The Bargain? Where, which side does it come down on? Clarity or mystery? I know where I think it comes down. Um, I think it does both, actually. If, if I tell you what I think, I was going to give it away. <laughs> uh, uh, so I think it summarizes it, but kind of vaguely. But if you think, I don't know, let me just tell you. If you think about making a deal with the devil, okay, that's, that's a bargain. Okay, so mm -hmm. to me, it's the bargain that we make with, with the devil or just, you know, kind of unconventional thinking or writing, which this stuff definitely has some of. Now, Patricia, you may have a completely different take on that. So I'd love to hear that. No, I tell you what, I'm glad I, I'm glad I asked now because I can see how it could come down on both sides. But to me, I could see it was making a bargain with the devil. But the way you the way you took the um, non-seed parts of the of the sequence, if you like, that sort of semi threw me. So I thought, you know, that that's adds a bit of mystique. The title adds a bit of mystique to it. But, you know, I can see where you're coming from with, with both sides. Oh, but I, mystique, mystique is good. Let's, let's not throw that out. <laughs> we'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> I love Satan's holiday, mixing stripes with plaids or plaids, as I might say, but Satan's holiday, mixing stripes with plaids. Fantastic. And then the idea of poking through a new thesaurus. <sighs> marvelous, marvelous. Anyway, we could speak all, <laughs> speak all day about that, but we need to get well, on. You know, Satan's holiday, that was the syndrome I had laying around, and I tell you, I was so happy to find a home for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love it. I think it's wonderful. So you've spoken of the, the short film verse, The Seed for the sequence mm -hmm. which obviously comes first and to go back to the idea of the titles are you going to make the title once you've got the seed or are you going to wait till the end i typically wait to the end okay. because i don't know what it's going to be you know and if you're writing with a collaborator then it's kind of fun to bet around titles mm -hmm. um, but I, I i think there was one case i did have a title mm -hmm. because i had three pieces that i had written before mm -hmm. And I could see that they would form a particular type of a mm -hmm. storyline or sequence or format. And I thought, okay, this could be what this is. But then I thought, well, is that too obvious? You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's just kind of fit together too neatly in my brain. But generally speaking, just write the piece and then think about, feel what it is about, and then you know, use your title uh, accordingly. And I was wondering if it worked differently if you were doing it on your own because you might have some idea when you start out with the solo sequence where it's going to end up uh, although it could be just like when you're writing a story i suppose you know a, a prose form story that once you start these things can take on a very different direction to the one you were anticipating at the beginning right and typically and i'm just thinking on title should not be a line from the poem mm -hmm. you know, i could reference something about the poem but generally speaking it's like what is this thing about now so let's move on to the verses themselves. Mm -hmm. A lot of people were wondering about the connections between them. Something mm -hmm. that came up time and time again, certainly to me and, and possibly to you, is uh, as we connect them, the verses that is, should our readers see and feel the connections? Yes, 
But what I think will actually happen in the process where they start to sense the connection, they'll start to anticipate something. So I think it's more on that level. Like, what is this about? Where's this going? And so I don't think anybody would probably get to the point where, oh, I know where this is going. Because if it's that obvious, you know, the poet might want to dig deeper next time or make it less obvious. But typically you get a sense of where it's going because you'd have an emotional response to haiku number one, the haiku number two, is that complimentary or is that contradictory? And then I think it's more of a sense than more intuiting. You've sort of given us a clue here, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. How do we connect our verses? Do you have any advice for us there? Well, they link to the, you know, each verse will link to the line above it. And sometimes I've noticed line three of a haiku, sometimes will just sort of what I call roll into the next single line. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to do that, but I like when it does. So it's almost like you could read it from top to bottom. So that's where you get multiple readings. It's like, wow, this link's here, this link's here. So within those 12 lines, you can get a lot of magic happening. Um, if your lines don't roll into the, your haiku doesn't roll into the next line, so to speak, that's okay too. Because sometimes if it's abrupt, you know, it's it's contradiction, then that work, that, that um, uh, feature works in there as well. Do you see it working as a, like a Renku would, uh, linking and shifting, or is it somewhat different? The uh, poem that follows a single line links to that line, but no, the linking and shifting you see in Renku or Renge, it doesn't happen here. This is more of a narrative flow. And so you might get um, circular uh, activity within the piece, but it's a, it's a whole different animal than, than Renge and Renku. Okay, and certainly less rules. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't like rules. Okay. You covered this before, but when you're writing with a partner, does mm -hmm. someone have to take the dominant role or are you just going to shoot the breeze as, as, as issues arise? Well, I've written with a number of people now, of course, much more so with Brian Rickett. And... Um, it's been my experience that whichever poet provides the seed haiku, that person typically takes the lead and sets the piece on a path. When Brian and I would write together, um, he might provide that initial seed haiku. I might come back with something where it's like, it was not what he was thinking and vice versa, not what I was thinking. It's like, wow, okay, so we have an element here that's a little different. What do we do next? And so that was where the game aspect of this writing process came into play for me and for Brian and for other people. It's like, wow, well, okay, so that's different. So it kind of, I think, heightens the experience a little bit, but there needs to be a leader. Otherwise, I know sometimes people just don't want to take charge, but somebody's got to take the lead at least. You know? <laughs> otherwise, you just kind of line them up on a page and hope something happens. But it's like, and when I say someone just needs to kick, put the, kick the ball onto the field, that's it. You know, and after that, you know, it's kind of a team sport with two people. Now, it's interesting because I, I thought a lot about this for reasons that might become clear mm -hmm. okay. towards the end of the podcast. But when you're working with, with a collaborator and you send them the, the seed haiku, essentially you're working with, with a reader at the very beginning mm -hmm. and we all know that our poetry is often read by a, by someone else in, in, in a different way to that which we wrote it a different meaning they give it a different meaning to, to the one we were an anticipating so i'm really interested what if your collaborator does exactly that they've read it in a completely different way to the way you anticipate you were anticipating and they come back with something that is such a leap that you can't see the link and and ultimately you're going to write the next three line verse on the back mm -hmm. of that what do you do do you sort of suck it up and have a have a go <laughs> or do you do something immediately well my experience of collaborating with brian mm -hmm. he might send me something it's like that's a little 
for me, it's a little tight. Can you loosen up the image a little bit? Mm -hmm. And for me, I'd send him something. He said, well, it's kind of abstract. Can we get a little bit more concrete? And so I would, we would just give some feedback back and forth about, is that something we can latch into what you just offered? Okay. Um, sometimes if something's like way off base, I might say, well, let's see what I can do with this. <laughs> um, but sometimes, sometimes you just miss the trapeze, you know? <laughs> and, uh, then it's like, well, let's, let's, let's try either revising this haiku or just coming up with a, with a different option, you know? That's all very well when you're, you're writing with Brian, who you've developed a good working relationship now over, over some time. What if you're working with someone brand new? I have worked with a few brand news in, in the recent past. And I might say, mm -hmm. they might give me a couple of pieces and see, see if any of these resonate. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And I do the same. Okay. So that's, that's is, a good piece of advice. Give a couple mm -hmm. of, of, of pieces and see. Yes. We're trying to make it a little bit shorter process for people. So I don't agonize over it. I'll offer mm -hmm. somebody three pieces if you have them and three pieces mm -hmm. from your collaborator and say, mm -hmm. any of these, you know, maybe you get lucky and all three of them work and you have three pieces going or mm -hmm. you can plug in one of the other options for like the uh, closing haiku. Try to keep thinking flexible about the, the writing process. Yeah. You know, but you have rules to constrain you, but you know, use it, use collaboration imaginatively if you can. Now you mentioned briefly there the the final verse. You really want some finality, I guess, at the end of a split sequence. It can't wander off into the ether. No, wandering off in the ether probably is not a good idea. Neither is just sort of collapsing at the finish, just before the finish line. <laughs> really, really should nail the ending. Either um, it's like lift the reader to an unanticipated place, or mm -hmm. it really um, has a, a gut punch to it, an emotional kind of closure, which is like boom. Um, but you really, something should happen there, and not just oh, okay, that's it. I think it's okay to plug something in because mm -hmm. now I finished the piece, but then it's like, well, does I do anything? Let's go back and do something else or maybe find a different piece. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to plug it in. Does it work? If it's not, find another piece or rewrite the piece to some extent, but it shouldn't just end. It should have some kind of response for the reader. Do you regard that then as one of the more important verses? Yes. No pressure for the person reading, writing the third verse then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, I would just say provide as many seed haikus as you can because this way you only have to write the second verse and your closing one is on the other guy mm -hmm. you know so the pressure's <laughs> on them <laughs> I have a question about the process mm -hmm. you've written solo as you illustrated at the beginning of the podcast and mm -hmm. you've written collaboratively do you have a preference it really depends where I'm at at that point. I do like to write solo. That's how I started, of course. In the beginning, there was just me doing it. I do like that process. I, and sometimes I will have a, several sheets of paper out with two or three going at a time if I have a pile of unpublished pieces. You know, I just sort of play around with them, like putting a puzzle together. I, I, that's how I work. I like that. Not that I have piles of stuff around all the time. I'm not that prolific, but... I, I can crank it out and then see what can I do with this for a split sequence, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I like collaboration. Uh, I, I find it, it can be tiring. I mean, you have mm -hmm. to be in the mood to reach out, relate, connect, work with somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, everybody I've ever collaborated with has a different work style, mm -hmm. a different approach to it, different, different types of poems. So it's a fresh experience. Mm -hmm. It's just that um, when it's just me, you know, I, I tend to be more introverted, so I like that, but I also like to, you know, connect with people and other writers and, and, and establish that type of uh, uh, writing relationship. I couldn't collaborate all the time, though. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I do like to write the solo pieces, uh, have a, enough for a collection of them at this point, mm -hmm. um, but they have a different energy when you write with somebody else, mm -hmm. you know. As I said to you, I, I got some questions and comments from mm -hmm. um, some of our listeners last time mm -hmm. and i have a whole batch of comments now coming up from keith Everts, and oh, okay. i'm going to invite you to to respond to them as we go along 
Now, he wrote this to me and he said, in general, I'd like to comment that the split sequence, because of its uncomplicated structure, is a winner. It enables a story to be told in a way which one haiku alone cannot, and even avoids. So, Peter, what do you say to that? Agreed. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. <laughs> Thank you. And he went on. He says, Peter, as its creator, is in a unique position to safeguard the sequence form, the split sequence form. I hope it will, be, will remain simple with no further rules being added under his guardianship. So, I mean, you've already said you don't like rules, but what can you tell Keith about, about that going forward? I do think uh, some basic rules are necessary. <clears throat> and the Charita has them, which I think is a great model mm -hmm. for laying it out. And then the Charita Trabalic, how it uses lines, the line sequences in different varieties, I think gives you plenty to work with. I've written hundreds and hundreds of Charita and I never get bored with the process. Mm -hmm. This sequence, very few rules. I think what we'll end up doing is not adding rules, but simply um, further articulating the ones we have. Okay. For example, it's a form that uses haiku. Some people will take that and say, oh, it's just going to be haiku only. Mm -hmm. Well, when I say haiku, I'm saying it kind of generically, it also includes senro, but not monaku and not concrete poems necessarily. Okay. Um, it's a whole different animal. It's not, it's not part of the, the deal here. But um, senro, for sure, without that, I would, a lot of the fun would go out for me. <clears throat> when I say haiku, it's both types of stuff. Okay. Oh, how do you feel about rhyming then? Um, <clears throat> I think if you focus on rhyming, like if you really think oh, I'm going to rhyme it like a sonnet or something, then you're really limiting yourself. And really rhyme becomes the primary driver for what you're doing i don't think that's a good idea that just makes it really rigid i do notice when i write i will get examples of internal rhyme coming up within mm. one line and then the following line perhaps and that usually comes up just in the process of writing it's not something i aim for because mm -hmm. i think it's uh, you know it's not my focus here and it feel, can feel contrived so okay. i, I but if it comes up in the process, does it add to the poem or does it kind of stand out as like, oh, look what I did? Yeah. I would say, cross it out then, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? If we have to talk in terms of rules. Sure, of course. What do, you, what do you want to see in your split sequence? I like to see those, you know, the 12 lines being adhered to, the title. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like there to be haiku or, or senru, but if you want to write sci-fi, mm -hmm. senru, I have written some pieces that um, have had 575 in there. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't typically write it, but if I do, it comes out that way. Yeah. I don't think generally it's a legitimate way of writing haiku because a lot of times it's padding it out mm. to reach hit those numbers. And um, that you may as well have that written by artificial intelligence, which that's what they do. I tried that experiment. It's like, oh, it's a beginner haiku. Yes. I, I would say, <laughs> let's not do that. But you can. And I'd love to read some sci-fi ones. Mm -hmm. It's just that you'd want to stick within the basic simple rules so we can say, we can all agree that even though this is what your content's about, this is a split sequence. This is not some other odd rogue, as uh, I Lee would say, contraption. You know? That's a good word. Now, we've covered this in the last podcast that we did together. How about using Tanker? Have you tried that? Um, I've been a couple of pieces with, with, with Tonka. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian and I have tried that. I have written early, early on. Mm -hmm. I wrote some, what I thought was Tonka. It really mm -hmm. wasn't Tonka. It was five lines. And I have written, I think Brian and I tried one, but I have written one myself, which was like using a Charita format. At least I was saying six lines. It's kind of unwieldy. And I decided that um, it really didn't add a lot to the piece that kind of stretched it out. Mm -hmm. I didn't see any gain from more lines because mm. it kind of lost the, 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 const the, the concentration, the um, compression of the form starts to drift yeah. off. I didn't, I didn't see that length was, uh, was helpful. That no, way. I, can, so. I can see what you'd mean by that. So mm. no, avoid in terms of split sequencing. Let's not go there for the time being. Yeah, I know people might say, well, let's try this, but I, I, I think you're writing something that's, that's, that's uh, you think it's a split sequence, but it's turning into something else. And 
let's just master the form. Mm -hmm. Not that easy, but it sure is fun and it's addictive. So. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've had so many comments, and you probably have too, that people are just loving this. They're loving working, well, they're loving doing it on their own, obviously, but really as a collaborative tool. As Jerome said at the, right at the beginning, as a collaborative tool, it's a fantastic tool to play off another poet. I've seen some examples of collaborative work when I won't mention names, of course, but it's like, wow, they wrote a split sequence. It's pretty, they, some poets have just never touched this stuff and here they are, They're, they want to try it and they yeah. kind of liked it. It's like, wow, and that's, that's, that's kind of the fun of seeing that. Like everyone's trying to try it out and enjoying it and the stuff's pretty good. So, must, must be great seeing your baby going out there into the world and people picking, picking it up and, you know, ping-ponging all around the world with, and into different uh, poets from different genres having a go. Well, I'm constantly pleasantly surprised. So Excellent. it's fun. Yeah, I'm grateful. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter, thank you very much for coming along today. Um, we have a little surprise, I think, for our, our listeners. You suggested that we write a split sequence to end the podcast. And our, our dear listeners, there is nothing more terrifying than writing a piece with the founder of a form. Um, but you can be the judge. You can tell us what you think. So Peter... Shall we um shall we premiere our piece? Absolutely. The seed haiku, well, it's more of a syndrome, but here it is. No regrets. The pillow knows I'm lying. Tin roof rusted. No regrets. Yellow pus splatters the looking glass. Sing me a love song. The pillow knows. Blues in the night, streaks of mascara tell the truth. I'm lying. Sanguine moon, the second trimester becomes the third. So I didn't think that was too shabby at the end, Peter. I, I was quite pleased with that. I'm impressed with the ending of the poem. That's like, whoa, oh. that really nailed it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. Your bravery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, I was interested. I, I, it might not look like it, but I worked so hard over each of those verses. The thought that of sending you two or three examples was just, um, I just thought, oh, why didn't I think of that? But never mind. We, we got but there, I, and I, I'm quite well, pleased with the result. Yeah, it, it's, it's funny. Like you know, you really threw me with that first poem. It's like, oh, man, that's like <laughs> visceral. What is going on? And I thought. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on. Several things. I thought, what, 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 what can I do to follow? up? So it did take me a while to come up with that second, mm -hmm. second round poem because I thought, ah, you know, I have to do that first one justice. So, <laughs> um, one thing I, I will point out that I really like how, you know, there's there's really folding into the, the following line, like sing sing me a love song, and then it goes into the pillow nose. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, that's not intentional, but it worked out that way. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, tell the truth, and then it's into online, and then the big truth comes out. And I thought, wow, that just really has a nice flow to it, but also it sets up the piece differently. So mm -hmm. I'm only pointing that out real specifically because if you're new to the writing of form, you don't don't note that. That's just kind of a fun aspect to it. And one of the ways that this piece has energy and movement within it, and when you look for that, it's like, whoa, that seemed to be happening. And that's okay. You know, so it just really worked out. I really like to tell the truth and then I'm lying and then the truth comes out. It's like, well, we didn't plan it that way, but mm -hmm. it worked out that way. The yeah. synergy between two poets. So. Yeah, I, I I sort of felt sorry for you after I'd sent you the, the, the first <laughs> First, first, which is why I was saying, you know, if a poet really sends you something that you weren't expecting, uh, where do you go from there? I was sort of half expecting you to come back and saying, "What are you doing?" But um, I, it was that first line took me back to a, a song from my teenage years, and um, then your second, your second verse took me in a slightly different way to the, the way I thought I was going with this story and the story just took over. So it, I, it was, it was a very interesting process. Thank you. Thank you. Peter. Sure. I, I, 
I invite you to write again if you'd like. Do it, do it easier the second time. But really, thank you. It was fun. And I think I do think uh, it really shows the collaborative process and first time writing together. That's what we came up with. I know it's not bad, not too shabby. As um, you were saying, it's not rubbish. No. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, I won't be quite so terrified next time, Peter. Um, so thank you once again for coming along. Now, is there any news that you would like to give us before we, we say our final goodbyes? I'm able to let you folks know that uh, uh, Chrissy Villa will be having an anthology of collaborative work coming out, stuff that she's written with, uh, gosh, probably 30, 40 poets. And that might be out next month. Mm -hmm. She's hard at work on that. And it sounds like it's going to be a real winner. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's a clear title yet, but... Um, you'll know when it hits the, hits the stands. And she's a real proponent of the form. And mm -hmm. without her, probably the first book that Brian and I wrote together, the first only book in existence currently mm -hmm. is, and wouldn't have been published, but she took a chance on us. And now she's really become a champion of the form. So mm -hmm. I think it'll be a great thing to, to read when it comes out. I also have a collection of uh, Monaco coming out probably within the next month. Uh, also, all solo Monaco, um, and that's going to be with Cyber, Cyber with Press. And the title is called "Where Days Begin," and that will be available from uh, Amazon and Cyber with Press, of course. So, grateful to them as well. I've read Chrissy's book or the anthology, and it's a great piece of work. And I know she's going to come along. Well, we're hoping mm. that she can, she's going to come along and read it. Maybe you'll be back because she's bringing some of her collaborators oh, uh, okay. to read with us. So That'd be great. we might hear from you reading sure. some of those. So thank you once again, Peter. Uh, thank you for coming along today. Thank and you. thank you for my terrifying but satisfying experience. And um, Always goodbye. Always a pleasure. <laughs> goodbye, Patricia. Thanks, Peter. <laughs>